Simplicity and ease is what you get when you host your podcast with Audio Boom. You can post up to five episodes per month, you get unlimited storage, and 500 minutes of recording time for each episode. Plus, advanced analytics, embeddable players, distribution of your podcast via Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Sovin, Spotify, and Stitcher. Pending approval by each platform. Right now, you can sign up for Audioboom's $9.99 monthly subscription plan and get your first month free by using promo code BOOM. That's B-O-O-M for one month free of hosting and distribution. Sign up for our $9.99 monthly subscription plan today. Before I start the show today, I have a favor that I'd like to ask of all of you listeners. You know that we have great advertisers that support the show and keep it free for you. One of the reasons advertisers love this show is that they know that we have amazing, engaged listeners. The favor that I'm asking is for you to take a few minutes out of your day and take a quick survey for me. This survey will allow me and my advertisers to learn a little bit more about our audience. All you have to do is go to podsurvey.com slash truth to take the survey. Or you can go to our homepage, truthandjusticepod.com, and click the pod survey link. The survey will only take five minutes. And it just asks a few questions to get to know you a little bit better. And it's kept completely anonymous. Your answers help us find advertisers that are well-matched to you, your interests, and the show. When you're finished with the survey, you can enter a monthly drawing to win a $100 Amazon gift card. Even if you've taken one of these surveys before, and I'm sure a lot of you already have, I would ask you to please just take that few minutes and do it for the Truth and Justice podcast as well. And don't forget that by doing so, you enter to win that $100 Amazon gift card. Once again, the survey is located at podsurvey.com slash truth. Or you can go to truthandjusticepod.com and click the pod survey link. Thank you for helping us to find the best advertisers so that we can always keep this show free. Today's episode is sponsored by Audible. Audible features over 180,000 audiobooks. It's a simple app that can be installed on your phone or tablet and allows you to listen to your favorite audiobooks just like you would a podcast. If you're like me and you love listening to the spoken word, Audible is the perfect fit for you. I personally use Audible to fill in the gaps between podcasts and when I really just need to unplug. Currently, I'm in the middle of listening to my favorite author, Christopher Moore's new release, Secondhand Souls. Moore is a comedic author, and I find that sometimes I just get overwhelmed in this case, and I need to just unplug and laugh a little bit. The great part about Audible is that you can carry your account across multiple devices. So if I'm outside mowing the grass and listening to my book on my phone, later the next day when I'm in my office working, I can turn the app on my iPad and it picks up right where I left off. Right now, for Truth and Justice listeners, Audible is offering one free audiobook. To get your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Serial Dynasty. That's audibletrial.com slash Serial Dynasty. Enjoy. Hello everyone and welcome to the first installment of Truth and Justice. This is your host, Bob Ruff, and I want to thank all of you for bearing with me through this transition of the name and logo change. I've tried to make the transition as smooth as possible by letting you all know weeks in advance that it was coming. For those of you that follow us on social media, I released the logo on Thursday on Audio Boom, Twitter, and Facebook. So a lot of you have already seen it and given me a lot of feedback on it. Personally, although I don't particularly like looking at my face in the logo, I think that Tate did an amazing job. So a slow clap to Tate Krupa for all the hard work she put into all of our new logos and banners. This transition that we've gone through is more than just a name and logo change. There are a lot of you that have been with me from the beginning, all the way from that first 15-minute fan show episode through several months of transformation into truth and justice. And we finally settled into the place that is going to launch us into a mission of righting the wrongs of a broken system. Together, from now and through years to come, we will fight for those that can no longer fight for themselves. We will stand in the gap between a broken court system and the wrongfully convicted. And again, I want to thank every single one of you who have helped to get us here. Through your emailed theories, thoughts, and ideas, your emotional support, listeners who have stepped up and helped out with the technical side of the show, like the music and the transcripts and the logo, 
The only reason that this movement has come this far is because of you, the listeners. While I'm the one who is behind the microphone, all of you have played a huge part in how far we've come. I also want to thank all of you who have contributed to the GoFundMe campaign. I'm absolutely amazed by all of you. The biggest hurdle in making this movement permanent was the financial investment required to set us up to do so. While this financial goal was something that would have been difficult for any one of us to complete on our own, together through hundreds of donations from listeners around the world, we are already almost there. For any of you that are listening that would like to contribute to the fund and help us take that last leap towards our goal, the website to donate is GoFundMe.com slash Truth and Justice. Or you can go to TruthandJusticePod.com and click the GoFundMe link. It doesn't take a large donation to make a difference. Many hands make light work, and that concept is what has brought us this far already. And again, thank you to every single one of you who have contributed. This week, Anand's attorney, Justin Brown, landed what I believe to be the knockout blow to the state's case in Anand's post-conviction relief proceedings. If you haven't already read about this online or heard about it on Undisclosed last week, on Tuesday, Justin filed Anand's response to the state's brief. I'll tell you right now, if there ever comes a time when I'm in trouble, I want Justin Brown as my attorney. The brief was extremely well-written, articulate, tons of case law was cited, and it was written in a very clear and concise manner. And more importantly than all of that, Justin absolutely pummeled the state's case. And before I get into a recap of what was included in that brief, I want to take a moment and give credit where credit is due. For anyone that cares about this case, and cares about justice for Hay, and cares about justice for Adnan, and has been actively involved in these podcast movements, Reading that response brought out all kinds of emotion. The most accurate word that I could use to describe my emotions when reading that response was pride. Not for myself, but for the team at Undisclosed. It was simply incredible to read that document and, number one, realize that Justin has successfully, completely dismantled the state's case, but also to see things in that brief that were discovered by the Undisclosed team. Susan, Colin, and Rabia dug into this case when no one else was willing to do so. They looked at it with new eyes, determined to find the truth and the discrepancies and the missing links. All of you listening right now and all of you that listen to Undisclose have literally played a huge role in something that will very likely result in Adnan finally being freed from prison. Without you listeners, all of Undisclosed episodes would have fallen on deaf ears. Your interest, your engagement, and your interaction made Undisclosed a household name. It resulted in magazine articles, online articles, blog posts, TV interviews, and every single one of those outlets drew in more listeners with more fields of expertise. A critical piece of that document was the information about the AT&T fax cover sheet that stated that incoming calls were not a reliable source for location. That piece of evidence, along with the state's own bumbling brief, appears to be a clear-cut, 100%, no questions asked, Brady violation. And if it is determined to be a Brady violation, that guarantees that a non-conviction will be thrown out, and he will either be retried or released. That document was discovered by none other than undisclosed host Susan Simpson just a few months ago. Robbie, Susan, and Colin all work full-time jobs, have families, and still find the time to conduct this research and produce the podcast that is going to free Adnan Syed. As I can personally relate, that is no easy task, and I admire the hell out of them for doing this. I am proud to know Rabia Chowdhury, Susan Simpson, and Colin Miller. Along with, of course, Justin, these three are heroes in my book, and they always will be. So what were the major revelations in Justin's brief? To put it in plain language, Justin used the state's own words against them, most importantly regarding the cell phone evidence. The state's prosecuting attorney, Kevin Urich, has gone on the record to say that Jay's testimony alone would not have been enough to convict, and the cell phone evidence alone would not have been enough to convict. But the two together make a strong case. 
Well, as I understand it, one of the burdens that has to be proved to a judge in order for something to be declared a Brady violation, you simply have to prove that there's evidence that the state did not disclose to the defense and that it's reasonable to assume that the disclosure of that evidence could have resulted in a different outcome at trial. From what Colin Miller said on Undisclosed, according to Maryland case law, the most useful source of determining whether the evidence would have made a difference in the case is by reverting back to the original prosecutor's closing statements. Both Urich and Murphy made sure to point out the significance of the incoming pings in Lincoln Park to the jury in their closing statements in a non's trial. Clearly, had the jury known that those incoming calls were not a reliable source to use for location, would have made a difference in this trial. And furthermore, had this information been disclosed, the jury would have never heard it. This evidence was clearly not reliable and was misused by the prosecution intentionally in my opinion. Had this information been disclosed to the defense, it would have been brought up in a Fry hearing before the trial, and without a doubt, no judge would have allowed this evidence to be brought in, as it was clearly unreliable. So the other prong of a Brady violation is proving that the information was not disclosed. Let's all give another slow clap to the state, because in their brief that they filed just weeks ago, they said, in their own words, that that fax cover sheet that clearly stated that incoming calls could not be used to determine location was in fact attached to every fax they received from AT&T. So they have admitted that that fax sheet was attached to every piece of their evidence that they had regarding the cell phones. And yet their Exhibit 31, which was the subscriber activity report used at trial to put it on in Lincoln Park in the 7 o'clock hour, did not have this fax cover sheet attached to it in evidence. So as Susan and Colin said in the last Undisclosed episode, the state's only choice here is either to admit the Brady violation or argue against their own brief. For those of you out there who are Maryland residents, there's your tax dollars hard at work. And another huge reveal in this brief was the affidavit written by Abe Warowitz. For those of you that are unaware, this was the expert witness that the prosecution used against Adnan at the trial. He is the one who testified for the state regarding the cell phone evidence. He was the most important witness for the state, with the exception of Jay Wilds. Well, lo and behold, Abe Warowitz has now jumped ship on the state and wrote an affidavit to be included in Adnan's brief. In his affidavit, he swears under penalty of perjury that he was, and I'll paraphrase this, duped by Kevin Urich. Evidently, Kevin Urich showed Warowitz the subscriber activity report on the day of the trial, but not the entire thing. He left off the pages that identified it as subscriber activity reports, and he also forgot to include the cover sheet that stated from AT&T that the incoming calls could not be used to determine location. Warowitz says in his affidavit that he doesn't know why he wasn't showed this information, and if he had been, he would not have testified in the way that he did at trial. If any of you ever had any question as to the despicable corruption of Kevin Urich, this act alone should be enough to show you what a horrible human being he really is. He not only lied and misled the jury, and failed to disclose exculpatory evidence to the defense, but he also lied to his own expert in order to get the testimony that he wanted. And the current state's attorney that filed the last brief has either been as equally duped by Kevin Urich, or they are also lying, because in their brief, in the midst of accidentally confessing to a Brady violation, they stated that the exhibit presented at trial was not a subscriber activity report, when in fact, It absolutely was a subscriber activity report, and that fax cover sheet stating that the incoming calls could not be used for location does apply to subscriber activity reports. The reason this slipped through the cracks was due to the Kevin Urich sleight of hand. Remove the fax cover sheet, take out a few pages, remove the page that labels it as subscriber activity report, and then present it as something other than what it actually was. So in the state's last brief, They either knew this and intentionally lied, or they have just proven the prosecutorial misconduct of Kevin Urich. Now, there's a lot more to this brief, and I'd recommend for all of you to go read it. You can find it all over the Internet. Just Google it or go on Twitter, check Robbie's feed or my feed. It's out there all over the place, and it really is a good read. 
Justin Brown is clearly a better author than Kevin Urich is. But the bottom line is this. With Justin's initial filing, he set the state up by presenting a great argument, citing all sorts of case law, and forcing their hand. By doing this, he caused the state to jam themselves up in their response. After that response, he had the state on the ropes, and on Tuesday, he delivered the knockout blow. As you all know, I'm not a lawyer, and so take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I personally don't see how there is any possibility that this does not result in a non-walking free. And every single one of you owes yourself a pat on the back. And for those of you that are still convinced of Adnan's guilt, and believe it or not, there are still people out there that still maintain that they are 100% certain, without any doubt, that Adnan is guilty. And I think Michael A. Wood had the best turn of phrase for these people. Willfully ignorant. Now moving along from the legal side of this case, on to our job. If I haven't made it clear before, what we're trying to do here is work on the practical prong of this case, while the undisclosed team and Anand's legal team work on the legal side of the case. As I've said many times before, I am convinced of Anand's innocence. And with that being said, in order to provide justice for Hay and her family, and for Adnan for that matter, we must solve this case. Anand did not do this but someone did, and we will figure out who that person is. One of the pieces to an investigation like this is to try to determine a profile for the killer. In homicide investigations, there are experts who spend their entire careers looking at crime scenes and using that information to narrow down the field of suspects. One of the most renowned experts in this field is Jim Clemente. Jim spent his career in the FBI working as a profiler. Profilers work in the opposite direction from the way that we are working. Many, if not all of you listening, have a suspect in mind. You have someone that you think committed the crime. And we start looking at the evidence and trying to figure out if the evidence fits this particular individual. The way a profiler works is just the opposite. They don't want to know anything about the suspect or suspects. They operate without confirmation bias. These are very skilled individuals who study crimes like this for a living. Since retirement, Jim has gone on to be a writer on the hit TV series, Criminal Minds. For those of you that haven't seen Criminal Minds, it follows an FBI behavioral analysis unit as they help to solve crimes by generating profiles. And Jim uses his real-world experience to help write the show. For the last couple of months, Jim has been working on generating a profile for the murder of Heyman Lee. He has the burial scene photos, the autopsy report, and the autopsy photos. Jim is completely unaware of any of the investigation that we've been doing. Even in the conversations that I've had with Jim over the last couple of months, I've been very careful not to clue him in on anyone who we might be looking at for this crime. That way he can generate an unbiased profile of who he thinks may have murdered Hay. And afterwards we can compare that to the evidence that we already have. I want to welcome to the show Jim Clemente. Welcome, Jim. How you doing, Bob? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Good to have you on the show. I've already kind of explained to the listeners leading into this uh, a little bit about your background from what I know, but right off the beginning here, do you think that you could take a few minutes and explain to the listeners your background uh, as far as profiling and, and kind of your career and what's led you to where you're at now and what you're doing currently? Well, I think uh, a lot of people have uh, misconceptions about profiling. Some people think it's sort of uh, voodoo or something. Um, it's actually criminal behavioral analysis. And that means that the profilers that the FBI train have extensive criminal investigative backgrounds before they become profilers. With me, I was a chemistry major in college, philosophy minor, and then went to law school. And uh, while I was in law school, I also worked in the prosecutor's office. And then my first job out of law school was as a prosecutor in the Bronx. New York City. I worked a variety of violent crimes and sex crimes while I was there. And then when I became an FBI agent, I also worked violent crimes and sex crimes. And then I did a bunch of undercover work. I did some sort of high profile, white collar and government corruption cases. And then did cold case homicides and major crimes in Washington, D.C. 
before being promoted to supervisor and special agent and into the behavioral analysis unit. It was a two-year sort of apprenticeship where you basically go through a 560-hour course at the profiling unit. You, uh, we, we, for that course, we bring in experts from around the world who are on our board of advisors. Robert Hare comes in and teaches us psychopathy, for example. And Dr. Callum Chan came in from Scotland and taught us uh, neuro-linguistic programming. Dr. Puck Deeds came in from Irvine and taught us abnormal psychology. You know, so we had the top guys in the field come in and teach us sort of a small group of new profilers these classes, and then we sort of intern with different apprentices with the different units of the behavioral analysis unit. During that whole process, we're sitting in on cases, case consultations, and then once we get certified, we're starting to work on cases ourselves. But one of the most important parts of that process is that we have multiple profilers looking at different cases. So right from the start, this case is a little bit of an anomaly because I'm looking at it by myself, and that's not the perfect process. Also, typically, being an FBI profiler, you have access to the entire criminal file you have access to all the witness information. You have access to any kind of records or documents or legal things that you need. So in this case, I just want to give a caveat that what I'm doing here today is really a preliminary profile based on partial information. I've studied the crime scene reports. I've studied the crime scene photographs. I've looked at the victimology. And those things are very important to us. And I'll explain that process why. So when we do a profile, and this actually is the type of case that we do a profile in, basically what a profile is, is reverse engineering the crime, the type of crime, the crime scene, the behavior exhibited during the crime, before and after the crime too, and the victimology. You reverse engineer all that to, to go back to the type of person who committed this crime. You only do it when it's an unknown subject. That's what an unsub is, unknown subject. In other words, the the person who's committing the crime is not known. So the cases in which profilers are most likely going to be called in are cases in which there isn't a tremendous amount of, there's no eyewitness testimony, there's no, uh, you know, forensic evidence, there's no DNA evidence tying a particular person to a crime. We get called in in those cases because what we focus on is behavior and not necessarily on all those forensic details that are missing in, in a number of cases like this one. So for me, when I do a profile, I don't want to know anything about the offenders, the potential offenders, the suspects in the case. All I want to know is victimology, everything you can possibly know about the victim, the victim's habits and thoughts and desires and education level and behaviors and ha- hobbies and interests and relationships, jobs and plans and travel and all that kind of thing, those are details that help us, that inform us about that victim. And then I would want to know all the facts I can about the crime and the crime scene. What exactly happened? Where did it happen? Was it a primary scene? Was there only one scene? Is there a secondary or tertiary scene involved in this case? All those things mean something. When you have a homicide, you look at whether or not it was a person killed in in one place and left right there, just discarded right there, and that was the disposition, the body disposition method, or was the body transported to a secondary or tertiary location, and then what was done? Is there what was the disposal method? And those things all tell us something about the, the offender, because each type of offender will lean towards a particular type of behavior in those arenas. So that's basically the process. I'm basing it on, as I said earlier, some limited information, although I've had access to a lot of the file. I had my assistant separate out all the offender information. And unfortunately, I'm working a lot of other projects right now, so I wasn't able to devote a tremendous amount of time to this. But I can tell you some specific things based on the victimology and crime scene. I guess the best thing we can do right now is is just kind of get right into what you've come up with. Well, I think we should start with victimology, okay? So when we talk about hay, we want to determine what her risk level is. And uh, let me just give you an idea of what risk level means. Okay. Risk level is the exposure to which a particular victim would have had to 
circumstances that would end up causing her death, ending up in murder, for example, in this case. So what we want to do is evaluate the victim's life and lifestyle and relationships to determine what that risk level was. So in this case, you have a teenage girl who was going to high school who was an athlete. She wasn't into you know, excessive alcohol or partying. She was not involved in prostitution. Uh, there's no indication that she was involved in drug use, you know, certainly not extensive drug use. Those are things, those categories that we're ruling out here would tend to make her a low-risk victim. She's described as, and her diary entries tend to confirm this, that she's very bubbly and emotional and outgoing and, and, and quite dramatic. But she's very moral and caring. She's not completely self-centered. She actually cares about other people. She's ambivalent, though, during the period, you know, a couple months, a few months preceding her death. She had met somebody new. She had been with this boyfriend for a while and was taken by him, but they had an on-and-again, off-again relationship. One of the interesting points to know what, that I would like to know was who drove, it seemed like she drove the breakups, but I don't know who drove the reunions, and that would be an interesting behavioral factor to learn. And so if I were investigating this case, that would be one of the things that I would want to know from her family and friends who knew about the relationship she was in to try to determine how exactly that, that happened, how they kept on getting back together. Now, it was clear that she was ambivalent, and at some point, the ambivalence sort of teetered towards the new boyfriend, the new guy that she started seeing, and that she was taken by him, and her diary entries tend to indicate that that was a decision that was made very soon before she was killed. So that is probably what we would call, you know, sort of a tentpole event. That would be something that we would definitely, that would raise red flags, that we would definitely want to put a pin in and, and come back and look at. The fact that she was an athlete, that she was engaged in athletics, that she was a well-rounded individual is also an important event. In other words, she wasn't isolated. She wasn't someone who, who she played a rough sport. She didn't, she's not a wallflower that would have just shrunk away uh, from some sort of danger or she wouldn't have been immediately compliant necessarily. She has a, it seems, a history of being sort of in love extreme love, okay? In other words, she didn't go from, you know, she didn't slowly build up to being in love. She sort of dives in with both feet uh, right away. And that's something that is a little bit impulsive. It's impulsive, it's dramatic, it's, it's emotional. And those are probably characteristics that her friends probably saw in her in her day-to-day -day life. Basically, what it comes down to is because She's not involved in drugs, prostitution, heavy alcohol, or partying. She didn't even have a cell phone. She was not the kind of person who would hitchhike. She wasn't running away from home. She wasn't doing all these things. We would categorize her as a low-risk victim. And that means that there's a very tight circle of people who would have access to her in order to kill her. And that is an important factor. There are two, I think, exacerbating factors that sort of slightly elevate her risk level. And that is, one, that she was lying to her parents about having relationships because of religious or cultural beliefs. And that slightly elevates her because there are situations in which, um, within families, females particularly, are targeted for honor killing. And that is something that is, is a possibility in a case like this. So we'll just put that sort of on a shelf as a possibility. However, it's a low probability. I have heard no evidence to direct me there, but what I'm trying to tell you is that is just one thing that we see in situations like this. It's one low probability possibility. Okay. okay? The other is that because she's ambivalent and sort of flitting back and forth between two different boyfriends, that is also something that slightly elevates her risk level. 
And a slightly elevated risk level would, certain, would simply mean that there's a few more potential offenders out there, unknown subjects, who could have committed this crime. Now, if she were a high-risk victim, the pool would be tremendous. It would be huge. It would be very difficult to limit the number of people who could be the offender in that case. So the good news is that she's a low-risk victim, so it's much easier to try to sort of narrow down the suspect pool. That's pretty much my assessment of her victimology. Do you have any specific questions you want to ask me on the victimology side of this? No, not necessarily. The only thing that um, I was wondering about when I was reading the diary, you had mentioned or had asked about who drove the reunions of their relationships that get, or the relationship getting back mm-hmm. together. And it seems like when I was reading it that there was at least one of the occasions, if not two, where she had, you know, I guess self-talk with her diary that she missed her boyfriend and uh, wanted him back and was wondering if he would forgive her. And she said she was going to ask for his forgiveness and would he, and then the next diary entry, they're back together. So I, I kind of took that as she was the one that drove them as far as to get, drove that train as far as to get them back together. I don't know if you had the same take on her, if you right. just don't recall that. Well, here's the thing. I, I, that's certainly a plausible uh, set of circumstances. It's also completely possible that boyfriend, and this would obviously, you know, rely heavily on an analysis of him, which I have not done, but the boyfriend could very well have instilled in her this sense of guilt about the breakup. Um, in other words, we're seeing the we're seeing the evidence that she felt guilty, but we don't know who actually drove that. And again, that was the kind of thing that I would like to do behavioral interviews of people around each of them so that you get a better sense of whether or not that was, you're seeing the evidence of her in her writing of, of the feeling that she hurt him by separating from him. But at the same time, she was doing it for herself. I mean, this is a typical thing that, that you know, late teenagers go through. This is a very normal behavior, going back and forth, being uncertain, not knowing whether they want to be with somebody or not, feeling strong uh, feelings for and against somebody. So none of that is out of the ordinary. But it does just sort of set up a potential uh, slightly elevated risk factor, and that's why I mentioned it. Okay, then as far as uh, victimology, I don't think I have any other questions on that if you want to move on to uh, the next level here. So the next level that we're talking about is going to be the crime itself. And here we have homicide. And um, it looks like it almost certainly is murder. Um, and basically, just to make the distinction there, a homicide is when one human being kills another human being. And a murder is when one human being kills another human being illegally. So that's the distinction between the two. So this looks like a murder, and the reason why I believe it's murder is because if somebody had a legitimate reason, um, if somebody accidentally, for example, ran over somebody else, um, and uh, you know the person was wearing all black and they ran into the middle of the road while somebody was driving down a highway, I mean, um, that person would not likely... Um, uh, make an attempt to conceal that body. Uh, so body concealment is an important factor here, and we'll get into it a little um, more in a bit. Okay. So the body concealment uh, is what indicates right from the top that this person was not, um, you know, it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't an accidental death. It wasn't something that uh, somebody didn't intend to do. When we look at, you know, sort of the crime scene observation, and we find that, one, it's, in a park, two, it's in January, three, it's relatively remote. Uh, In other words, it's not, certainly, this was not a displayed body. Nobody wanted, the person who put her there did not want somebody to discover her. We call that concealment, and there are several kinds of concealment. There are partial concealment, there are complete concealment, there's temporary concealment, and there's permanent concealment. And an example of permanent concealment might be basically incinerating a body, turning it into ash, and distributing the ashes into the ocean. Um, That would be pretty permanent concealment, encasing somebody completely in concrete and tossing them 
off a boat 20 miles out to sea. Again, that's pretty good permanent concealment. Um, burying somebody eight feet in the ground, you know, or under the foundation of a house, something like that is pretty permanent concealment. But what we have here is what we would call partial temporary concealment. In other words, you have a partial burial. Somebody took the time to dig and to cover this victim, to place the victim behind a log in a depression, but still dig out more dirt and then cover the victim with dirt and leaves and debris, you know, basically forest debris. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, when I look at this, when I look at the crime scene, I see this as ill plan and a novice attempt at doing this. And what that means to me is that the person or persons who did this were not criminally sophisticated. In other words, although they could be smart, they were smart enough to try to conceal the body, they weren't experienced enough criminally in order to actually do the job right. So why is that? Well, first of all, when I say it was ill-planned, in January, in the sort of, in the area around, you know, Maryland, it's pretty cold. In fact, the, the following three days, I think there was a storm, uh, you know, an ice storm in right. that location, right? Yes. Right. Um, the ground had to be pretty cold. And when the ground is cold, it's pretty hard. And when it's pretty hard, it's very difficult to dig. So what that tells me is that the person who did this or persons who did this did not know that that was a very difficult thing to do until they had already committed to doing it, okay? So that tends to tell me that it is somebody who's who's generally not criminally sophisticated, so not experienced in killing, not old, in other words, hasn't had, had the, you know, the time to grow up and understand and pre-plan things very well, and somebody who just, simply had to act this way because they felt that there was a a reason to do this rather than just discarding the body wherever the body was killed. Okay. So that makes it a partial burial and attempted concealment. Now, let's look at who conceals bodies after they kill a person. So if you're a burglar and you go to a city you don't live in, and you break into a house thinking that it's empty, and you surprise somebody who lives in the house, and you hit them over the head and they die. What you're going to do 99.9% of the time is get out. You might grab something on the way out because you came there to steal something, but you would get as far away, distance yourself as far away from that crime scene and that body as you possibly could. Now, let's take that one step further. Let's say that happened in a car. Somebody's driving their car. Somebody decides to carjack that person, and in the process of this carjacking, somebody, that, that offender, kills the victim. Again, you've now done something that you didn't intend to do, but now there's a dead body with you. You are going to get as far away from that dead body as possible because the longer you spend with that dead body, the more chances of you being arrested and convicted of murder. So what offenders do typically is get as far away as possible from that body. The people who conceal a body, the people who take the time to transport, to stay with a body, and then conceal that body, take the time to, say, partially bury that body, are people who have a relationship with that victim and a known relationship with that victim. And those are two very important things. In other words, in order to overcome the fear and the necessity to get away, because when people commit a crime, there's important things that they have to do. The MO elements, modus operandi elements, are the elements necessary to commit the crime and to get away and prevent discovery and arrest. So this person made the decision that because there is a known relationship between them and the victim, they wanted to conceal the body. And I'm talking about the highest probabilities here. 
Okay. The probability of this being a somebody who spent time with this body, this dead body now, a considerable amount of time because they had to transport the body. They had to bring the body then into the woods. They had to then dig the hole, and then they had to put the body in the hole, then cover the body up and get out of there. All that time they were at risk of being exposed. And when we're talking about somebody who would do that, we're talking about someone who is typically known not only to the victim, but the relationship is known to other people outside. In other words, it's not necessary that someone, if the victim knows this offender and no one else, knows this offender or that the victim knows this offender, then there's really no reason for that offender to spend the extra time to bring that person to another location. So let's look at what does that tell us? The partial burial, the attempted concealment, the low criminal sophistication, the novice, ill-planned nature of this, and the offender most likely being known to the victim and that relationship being known to others. To me, that tells me that we have an offender who's who's relatively young, and I know this because he's impulsive, and he doesn't have the criminal sophistication or the thought processes that would help him plan, have planned this better, him, him or them. Okay. The weather was bad for disposal, this method of disposal. This victim was killed in, in the Maryland area. There's plenty of water around that could have been used to, as a disposal method. There's plenty of dumpsters around that the body could have been dumped into. But this person wanted to prevent discovery. Didn't do a good job at it, but they wanted to prevent discovery. And so that's what they did. Now, one of the possibilities here is that this is a secondary disposal site. And what I mean by that is there are many times when a victim is not discovered, when a body is not discovered immediately, and the offender hasn't done a tremendously good job at concealing the body, that the offender will then try to use a better method of concealment. But the fact that it's stowed that night or the next day and did the same for a few days would have made it difficult to then do a better job, to go back and do an even better job of burying because, of course, you know, if you try to bury somebody in the snow, well, when there's snow covering, you know, obviously there's going to be mud and dirt and the ground's going to be even more frozen. It's going to be much more difficult to accomplish. So I think they just left it as it was. Now let's look at the body itself. Well, from the autopsy, we know that, a few things from the crime scene and from the autopsy. We know a few things. Okay. Robbery was not the motive. And we know this because there was jewelry still on the victim, right? Right. Rape was not the motive because there's at least there's no indication that anything like that occurred. So we're, we're really reducing the number of possible we're funneling down to even smaller and smaller numbers that this person victim could have been become victimized by. So we'll look at the possibilities. Was this victim a victim of opportunity? Well, when you have a lowest victim, somebody who isn't running away, somebody who isn't hitchhiking, somebody who has her own car, somebody who has a job, somebody who goes to school, somebody who has a, a full intact family, somebody who isn't strung out on drugs or doesn't have problems blacking out on alcohol, when you don't have any of those things, the, the risk is so low of just an opportunistic falling into the hands of a, you know, very bad person um, who then kills them, a stranger. You know, this is sort of the, the, it's a very low risk of somebody who would be considered a stranger danger, somebody who is not known to this victim. Okay. Um, what, is, what is a higher probability is that this victim was targeted, specifically known by the offender, specifically targeted by the offender for a particular reason. See, reason we study victimology is because the offender picks a particular victim at a particular time, in a particular place, in a particular manner, for a particular purpose. And all those choices 
reflect back on the offender. So looking at the victim actually is like holding up an, a mirror to the offender. He's leaking out information about himself by his choice of victim. So he chooses a very, you know, good, by all accounts, a good girl, somebody who cares about other people, somebody who's liked by her friends, somebody who's athletic, who's involved in school, who's doing all sorts of activities. She's working. She has all these things going for her. She doesn't have a lot of opportunities for somebody to snatch and grab her. It's very, very low risk. However, somebody who has a personal cause against her could have killed her out of rage or revenge. Okay. I think those are the two highest probabilities based on the information that I have right now. Rage or revenge? So, yeah, rage or revenge. Okay. Um, the chances of her falling into the hands of, for example, a serial killer who happened to be in the neighborhood, for example, if that's a possibility, the chances of that are going to be very low. Does it happen? Yes. Is it going to be, you know, something more than 1%? Or less than 1%. I would put it in the less than 1% of probability. So it, it's a very low probability in this case. There's just no indications of it. And if this were the case, that serial killer would have, I mean, what's the motive for that kill? I mean, it's not sexual. It's not robbery. What is the motive? Unless this guy was psychotic, having suffering from some kind of delusion and targeting this victim as a victim of opportunity, there was no evidence on that body that anything else was done to her or that souvenirs were taken from her or that anything, even atypical sexual activity was done to her. So there's very little room for, for this serial killer to have done this particular crime. All right, that makes sense. So when we're looking at this, and a lot of this stuff may sound like just common sense stuff, but what I'm doing is putting it all together to sort of shape this. Because when, when I look at the victimology and the crime and the crime scene, I would say a serial killer who happened upon this person would never spend the time because nobody knows that that serial killer has a relationship with this girl. They would never spend the time taking her around in the car, transporting her to this park, dragging her out into the, or carrying her out into the woods, digging a hole, and partially burying her, and then covering her with dirt and debris. That's a lot of time to spend where anybody could have wandered in and found that person. And why do I know that's a possibility? Because the person who discovered the body wandered in maybe to take a leak, maybe for some other reason, who knows. But a person did discover the body in that exact location. So the person who did this actually risked being discovered at the time that they were doing it. Sure. So I would say that really reduces the chances and the probabilities that we have a totally unrelated, non-motive-driven offender who committed this crime. Okay? So... I believe that we have a young, impulsive, known to this victim, first-time offender who believed that he or she had to hide the body because they didn't want it known that she had been killed. Serial killer wouldn't give a damn. Right. In most cases, unless they were, unless they were a serial killer who was working the neighborhood, who wanted to didn't want to light up the neighborhood. In other words, didn't want anybody to know that he's been killing in this neighborhood. But somebody who's passing through, kills here, kills in another state, kills in another state, they can just leave the person where they are, in their house, in their car, in the street. It doesn't matter because they're not associated with that location. So that's the last bit of my profile is that the person or persons who killed this victim and put her body there had some familiarity with this location and had some connection to the location and the circumstances of the kill. And that's why they moved her body to another place. Okay. Does the, you started to talk about the, the body and the condition in the burial site. Is there anything you, you were able to pick up based on her injuries or the lividity or anything like that, that, that helped you out at all? 
Well, the Levitia is a question, and that's why I, I that's why I posited that it's possible that this person, this offender, had temporarily concealed the body, and most likely that would have been laying face down based on the lividity, and then transported the body after lividity had set and buried the body at that time. So that would mean that the person would have had to have sort of kept the body in some secure location or put the body in a... It, it could very well put the body in that very same exterior location and then gone back and dug a hole and then concealed the body better. Only partially, only temporarily, but a better job than they originally had. So those are possibilities based on what I know of the forensics and of that crime scene. But it's fairly clear and I know that, you know, that, that some, you know, the temperatures and body temperature and so forth can slightly affect lividity and so forth. So it's not an exact science, for example, of how many hours the victim laid in a particular position and so forth. But there's a whole bunch of factors that make it sort of a window rather than a precise time. Now, when a body is discovered uh, you know, shortly after death, there's a lot of other things like body core temperature and all these things that you can you can look at when uh, this is a winter situation, so there's not as much bug or critter activity. So that is also a way that you can time death. But, you know, generally, and that wasn't available here because she was discovered so much later and it was, you know, covered by snow at least part of that time. So there's all these factors that we don't have, we can't rely on, but there is a definitive attempt to conceal this body. And in my mind, looking at the totality of circumstances I know, I believe that is because the person who did this is actually known to the victim and other people know of that relationship. So the reason why I point that out is because there's much made of the fact that the victim sort of seemed to have sort of an appointment, something to do, uh, you know, nebulous. Uh, nobody, she didn't know, um, nobody knows exactly what she was going to do, but she had to do something, and she didn't show up, pick up her cousin at the time she did every day, and so there's a slight, very tight window of opportunity in terms of the sort of abduction that most likely preceded this. And when I say abduction, I'm, losing, I'm using the term very loosely because she could very well have gone with this person willingly, but this person had an intent, at, at least at some point formed an intent to kill her, and, uh, you know, remove her ability to leave. Um, and that's what I mean by abduction. Um, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have been, you know, forceful taking away. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And as far as you, you, you've seen the, the photos and the autopsy reports and things, the nature of the injuries, you know, we, there was, there were a couple of injuries to her head and, from what I've read, there were no uh, defensive wounds on the body. Did you get that as far as, like, from the strangulation? Well, Did you get that same take from that? Well, I mean, there was at least what it appeared to be that also could be affected by the, the fact that she was at least spent some hours laying face down. But there were, she appeared to be bruising around the face, which may have been enough to have either gotten her totally compliant or knocked her unconscious or at least disabled her to a certain degree. And so that could be why the person, why she didn't have, you know, traditional defensive wounds. So it's possible that the person who did this incapacitated her by, let's say, punching her in the face, right? Okay. It's possible that, let's say, uh, you could concoct a scenario which she's laying on a couch and somebody puts a big pillow on her body and kneels on that pillow and takes, you know, pin, pinning her hands, you know, one of the cushions from the couch, pinning her hands down, and she's unable to struggle or reach up and try to pull the fingers around, off from around her neck. So th there's ways that can be done. If you're talking about someone who is taller, better reach, heavier, physically stronger, it's a lot easier to do. If you're going against somebody who has those attributes, you're going to see a lot more ability to struggle. So you know, somebody could be stunned by punches in the face. They could be knocked unconscious. Uh, it's maybe that's not 
possible. It's hard to tell based on, you know, on what the findings were in this particular autopsy. But at least we know there was some trauma to the face and head. So that's a plausible explanation for why this happened. There are also some strange shaped markings, you know, diamond shaped markings on the body that could be, you know, because I, I haven't seen any color photographs. So I'm not sure. I, I only saw the black and white one. So I'm not sure whether those, what the nature of those marks are. But in other cases, we have seen markings made by, you know, something that was man-made object that was, uh, that the body was placed on top of, you know. And that, that could very well be what happened here, whether it was something that was on the floor, wherever this girl was murdered, or outside on the ground where her body lay after she was murdered. Uh, it's just difficult to know. But I will say this. I saw several parallel three, four, five, six-inch scratches on the back of the body, which are an indication to me that body was at least dragged, could have been dragged partially, and that could have been being dragged when into the hole or while in the hole to just situate the body for burial. Okay, did, I was going to ask you too, do you think that from what you've seen from the crime scene, uh, that the disposal of the body, I know we don't know for sure, but in your best estimation, do you think it would have been done by one person or two people? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. The indicator, the, the necessity to drag a body reduces the chances of it being two people at least at some point. In other words, I think that leans more towards one person because if there were two people, at least if they're both able-bodied, she wasn't that heavy, they should have been able to carry her and not have to drag her at all. But again, there was only three or four parallel what I would call scratch drag marks that on the back of the body. So it doesn't mean that, that, that she was dragged a long way. It could be just that that's what happened when uh, the surface changed and, or that something under the body was sharp enough to scratch her skin. So, you know, but I, you know, there's a slight indicator, I would say, that it was, it was only one person at some point that dragged the body. Um, are you comfortable with me running a couple of possible scenarios by you as far as the actual murder itself and how it occurred, just kind of theories and see what you think about them? Um, yeah, I mean, are you going to be naming names? And No, no, I just want to talk about, I was going to ask you about, you know, like as far as we were talking earlier about like the head blows and things, like a couple different scenarios of whether you think they may be probable or or not based on what you've seen. All right, you know, I'll tell you whether or not I can't, I can or can't, Pine on them based on what I know. I mean, again, I, I specifically limited what I read because I did not want to have some sort of bias as to what happened. As long as you're not going to, you know, what you're saying is going to, isn't going to bias me, I'm fine. You know, if you're just throwing around potential scenarios like hypotheticals, that'd be fine. Yeah. And that, and that's all it is. And it, and it's really just more related back to, uh, the nature of the injuries, like you, we were talking about the blows to the, um, to the head or face and then the, the lack of defensive wounds. I, I believe if, if I remember correctly, when I read the autopsy report that the, the two contusions on, on the head were, were not so much on the face, but there was one on the, the temporal, the the yeah, temporal and then uh, yeah. the right temporal and then right occipital, which would be towards the rear. So like kind of in the temple and then kind of back right of the head. Do I have that right? Uh, that there's a blow so in. So it's basically the temporal and the occipital. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, both on the right side. Yeah, so uh, both on the right side. Yeah, the the right temp temporal uh, area of the head, and then the right occipital area. So kind of the back right hand part of the head, and then right. So the occipital would be the the bone in the back of the head, and then the temporal would be you know by the temple. Yes, but if if that's where the blows were at in those two places. Combined with the uh, the lack of defensive wounds, if the scenario is possible that those blows would render her unconscious and she was strangled while unconscious, if that was a situation, would that tell you anything more about the nature of the crime or the or the profile of the unsub? Yeah, let's think about it. Okay, typically in murders, there is some motive driving the offender kill, and 
when someone does kill, that motive many times is very evident in the body. If it's a sexual motive, then typically there is an indicator of sex. If there's, you know, a bloodlust or picurism or some other type of paraphilia, um, typically those there are, you know, it's evident. In other words, this type of kill is a very personal kill. It could be from the front, eye to eye with the victim watching life leaving her. And that's a very personal thing. Some people, like the DC snipers, kill from afar, long distance serial killers. Some people engage in what we call wet work. In other words, they don't mind getting all bloody and messy. Um, this was a very clean kill. So again, it, that is probably something mirrored in the lifestyle and, and life of the offender. In other words, it was, it was neat and tidy and not disgusting and messy. And uh, the person didn't necessarily, you know, have to clean up afterwards and so forth. So the all given all those things, I would say that the motive for this murder um, was not sexual, was not uh, robbery, which is why I sort of landed more heavily on some sort of rage or revenge. Some type of personal motive, either being so angered by something or wanting to get back at somebody for something or a combination of the two that would have driven this particular murder. If this, if that is the scenario and she was rendered unconscious, does the fact that she may have been unconscious and then strangled while unconscious add to that or, or make any difference in that at all? Yeah. Okay. So let's explore that. So what, what happens? What does that mean? The, the actual physical, um, act of strangling someone who's unconscious versus someone who is staring you in the face. It may be difficult for somebody to actually do that for the first time. And I believe this is an indicator of it being, you know, the first time for this offender. Uh, somebody who, you know, for example, a sadist would want to look into the eyes of the killer, excuse me, of the victim, because they would want they want to be able to see the, the fear and the let that person know and cause the suffering of that person. They, they that that's what gets a sadist off. This person probably didn't want to do that, and it's easier for most people who are going to murder to murder somebody who is not fighting them was compliant and who isn't staring them in the face with accusatory eyes. So it may be another indicator that this is a first time kill. And it's certainly not an indicator that we have a sadistic person. And it's consistent with somebody who is younger and less sophisticated, both criminally and forensically. It would have been possible to, if she was manually strangled, strangled, it would have been possible to get the offender's DNA from around her neck. In your opinion, does this look more like a heat of the moment crime of passion or premeditated, or can you tell? I would say that the premeditation, if at all, wasn't very deep. The person who did this certainly didn't premeditate it to the extent that they had a very effective plan at disposing of the body with permanent concealment. However, the person who did this, you know, got away with it for a period of time. The body wasn't even discovered for a month, right? Right. So that would indicate, especially for somebody who was a novice at this, it would indicate some level of thought and planning. But as I said, the planning was not effective planning. The goal would have been to permanently prevent somebody from finding that body so that it would never, nobody would ever have evidence to come back to that person. So I would say that it, there is a, I don't know, it's hard to say, it's hard to lean really one way or the other. So when you're distinguishing between a premeditated murder and a crime of passion, there are a couple of things you want to look at. Premeditation, you know, it would be highly organized, 
very well thought out and very well executed. Typically, okay. A crime of passion is one in which there is no planning and execution and post-defense behavior are sort of very haphazard. This person was able to have the sort of presence of mind to at least, even if it's temporary, temporary concealment of the body was effective for at least a month. And that gave whoever did this at least a month to get sorry straight, to figure things out, to try to cover tracks, you know, whatever. You know, that, that's some effectiveness. And if the person did this out of heat of passion or rage, then I would say that, that that person would have been sort of higher end of intelligence. In other words, because they're new at this, that they were able to do something quickly that was effective at least for some period of time you know, at least for a month. So I would say that what this gives me is an indicator that the person who did this is probably, although young and inexperienced, probably somebody who was fairly intelligent and somebody who was fairly good at recovering immediately when something goes wrong. And also, as I indicated before, somebody who was probably fairly meticulous in their life, in their personal life. And appearances would have been important to that kind of person. Can you expand on that? Like, what, what would someone notice from somebody that kind of fits that characteristic as far as their, just, just their personal you know, appearance? They would, yeah, their personal appearance and their surroundings and how they uh, came off to other people. And they would be, you know, let's say, you know, if they weren't from an affluent family, they might want to pretend they were or, you know, you know, wearing a lot of bling as opposed to somebody who was very, you know, un, Concerned about their appearance, they 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 would keep be unkempt. They they wouldn't clean their sneakers every day. You know those kinds of things. Whereas somebody like the kind of person who would murder in this way is probably somebody who is more concerned. Uh, you know, clean iron clothes. You know, decent outfit. Looks like as much money as he can look like, as clean as he can be. You know meticulous hair, that kind of stuff. Uh, would things like uh, like nice car, clean room, things like that? Yeah, I would, if that is something that he, where he'd be, that would be seen by, you know, the public. If he has a private room that, you know, nobody gets into because it's in his house, um, maybe not the cleanest room, but anything outside, the, the outside projection of that, I think, would be very neat. And it would tend to, I think, lean towards somebody who had a clean, you know, kept his car clean. I know on the East Coast, it's a lot harder than it is on the West Coast because of weather conditions, especially during, you know, winter months. But um, I think that that kind of person would be, would lean more towards keeping it as meticulously as they could. Getting back to when you were talking about the killer's ability to recover quickly and come up with a plan for the body disposal, uh, what I was thinking when you were telling me that was there's at least a theory out there that the body was laid somewhere for a period of time. You know, in some estimates, I've heard estimates from six hours up to 10, 12 hours for the lividity to set in. Uh, does that factor in at all that if, say, say it happened and then they, you know, they had, they took six hours to figure out what to do and that's why the body laid there that whole time? Do you think that plays well, at all? Um, that's, I mean, I think you're, you know, that's a possibility. But as I said before, it may not be that they took six hours to think about something. It's just they put the body in one location and then had another opportunity to put it in a better location or to more to 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 conceal it to a greater degree. Um, I don't believe that they buried the body, unburied the body, and then buried it again. I think they may have put the body in, you know, in a in a patch of woods or in a place and then nobody discovered it right away and then moved it so that they could conceal it better. In other words, for example, if somebody had to be somewhere, they could only go so far. They couldn't, it's good to do what they did to that body. In other words, dig that hole and, and put the body in there. I would think that they spent probably almost an hour, 45 minutes or an hour 
digging and moving and carrying body, you know, from from the car to the woods and then digging the hole and then putting the body in and then covering it up and, and, and trying to cover it. And, I, you know, they did a pretty good job of, of covering. You know, there was concealment, but burying was, was you know, a really, they did a bad job of burying. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the body was there. I mean, there's there's dirt. The, the body was in dirt, so there was dirt thrown over the body, but the body wasn't completely underground, clearly. And parts of it were exposed by the time the person had found her. So, in other words, they were able to. That would mean that they were able to get the body to a place temporarily because they had to be somewhere else or somebody might have come upon them when they were first trying to bury it, whatever. But get the body to a place in a position laying face down and then move the body. It, it could have, when I say move the body, it could have been literally two feet that they moved the body right. into the hole after they dug it. Okay, so like if they would have transported the body, say, out to Lincoln Park later in the ground and then came back later and buried her. Yes. That's a reasonable hypothesis based on the lividity and the fact that it would have taken, let's say, to get the body there, to then take the, you know, check around to make sure nobody's there, find a, a reasonable spot, then bring the body out to that spot, then dig the hole, and then cover. I would believe that process took about an hour. Okay, I would agree with that as well. And then, do you think it would be a reasonable hypothesis to another possible scenario if, say, she was killed somewhere private, like in, say, somebody's house or apartment or in a hotel room to where it, she was just, for that period of time, was just left lay right there while they concocted a plan and then took her out and buried her later that night? That is a possibility, but that is a extremely risky possibility. In other words, that means that that person spent either, you know, all six or eight or 10 or 12 hours with that body, which is extremely risky. That means they spent all those hours not in the public doing what their normal life was. That means they, they're in a place where someone very well could have seen them going in, could see them coming out. Maybe, maybe they had to register. Maybe they, you know, the, neighbors saw them, whatever. It's just an extremely risky thing to do. What offenders typically do, and I can tell you this after me and my colleagues have worked tens of thousands of homicide cases and consulted on tens of thousands of homicide cases, that offenders who do not have a known relationship with the victim will not spend the time for concealment. They will leave the place and all offenders will try, unless they are in, you know, a very secure bunker where they have no worry at all about somebody coming and surprising them, they will distance themselves from that dead body as soon as humanly possible. Right, and I, I absolutely agree with that. I kind of have, and, and this is just nothing more than my theory from, uh, one of the theories that I've wrestled around with was, like, say it was somewhere, like, in a hotel, and it wasn't planned and it happened and they, and they did do exactly what you just said, which is get away from the body, lock the door, put the do not disturb, get out of there and then sit there and think about it for several hours. Then after dark, realize they need to go back and get, they need to get her out of there because they registered for the hotel and went back and got her and, and buried her later at night. Um, and it's like I said, that's just, just, just a, one of the personal theories I was rolling around. I was just wondering if you thought that was something that is in the realm of possibilities. It is in the realm of possibilities. Um, and, you know, obviously there are, I mean, it is a possibility. Yes. Is it a probability? The, the chances of somebody, you know, you've just doubled the chances of you getting caught by going back to the scene where you left the body. Now, you are sophisticated enough and could surveil that place and make sure there were no cops there, make sure nobody's been in their room, make sure no, no maids have come in and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you're reasonably confident, you know, then maybe that would be a risk you'd be willing to take. So it is, so it's a possibility and I'm not saying that it's, um, so I'm saying it's not impossible. Right. 
it could have it could happen that way. Um, I'm just saying the probability of that is lower. An hour and a half into this, I think I picked your brain enough for one night, um, and I know you're yeah, you're thanks. Sick. I appreciate it. <laughs> You'll sleep good tonight. You've cleared your brain. Will you be willing to um, sometime in the future? Now that now that we have the profile, because I've been, uh, as you mentioned, and we've mentioned in this conversation, yeah, you know, just, ha- have just please call it a preliminary profile. Okay. okay. Yeah, as we've got this preliminary Thanks. profile, because we've intentionally held, um, I've intentionally held information back from you at your request, so that it didn't bias you. Now that we have kind of a preliminary profile. What I would love to be able to, you know, through email and talking sometime over the next several weeks or month or whatever it is, maybe start going a little further with this and maybe you can return back on the show and give us an update at some point. Sure. And I'm sure, you know, if your listeners have questions uh, that you want to pose to me, that's fine. Uh, and I may not have been told, uh, this is a, this is a very unusual set of circumstances. Okay. This case is unusual to begin with, but doing right. this, um, basically under the circumstances is, it's just, you know, not normal. Normally I would have the whole case file spread out in front of me. I'd pour through it for, you know, hours and days and weeks and, and give, you know, a full complete behavioral analysis and profile. But I'm just not able to do that in this case uh, at this point. And I've done what I could with the time I had available and the information I have available. Um, if there are questions that arise out of what I've said or people don't understand something I've said or you find something that I was um, I didn't recall properly about the, the forensics or the, the, the uh, situation. I get it. Um, I do know um, one of the guys who actually uh, worked the crime scene. So um, I, you know, I have not done any kind of uh, interview of him at this point, but um, I would, I, I would like to at some point do that. Um, and maybe he'd be, be able and willing to talk to you about it. I'm not sure, but if that's if that's the case, that we might get additional information out of that that isn't on a document. That would be yeah, that would be fantastic. Well, hey, I you you've helped sure. us immensely, and I really appreciate. And and for the listeners, you know, uh, what Jim didn't mention at the beginning is that he's also a writer for. Uh, the Criminal Minds TV show, which takes up a lot of his time. And so um, I can't stress enough how invaluable it is to for Jim to take this time out to look at this case and talk with us today. And so, you know, personally, I want to thank you, Jim, for taking the time to do this for us. Uh, well, thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, yeah, I do write for Criminal Minds, and I consult on a, a number of shows. And um, I was the, the tech advisor on three new pilots this season that all, got picked up for series criminal minds beyond borders which is going to be great starring gary sinise quantico uh which is a real hit uh kind of a soap opera take on the uh or 90210 take on the fbi academy okay. and then blind spot which is which is a pretty intense uh, you know crime drama that's uh that really i think it's the biggest it had the biggest opening for any new show this season so i was pretty happy with the things that i'm working on well fantastic so i know I, I don't get much time to watch tv but i've been checking out criminal minds over the last uh, couple of weeks since we've been talking and, and i'm just enthralled with it. i think it's great well i really appreciate that yeah. all right take care yep right, take care you. jim you have a good night jim has given us a lot to think about all of these interviews that we've been doing have not been for nothing. They are a means to an end. And now Jim Clemente has given us a profile to work with. All of these things are tools that we will use to ultimately find the truth and bring justice. Next week on Truth and Justice, we'll be applying the information that we've just learned from Jim Clemente to the known evidence in our current list of suspects. If Jim's profile is correct, we have significantly narrowed down the field of the possible people who could be responsible for this murder. And if the guilty party is listening to this show right now, know this, we are not going away. And we will not stop until the truth is revealed. Thank you to Johnny Rose of Slightly Subversive Music for creating all of the music for the show. 
and another huge thank you to Take Krupa for creating our logo. I also want to give a shout out to my friend and tattoo artist, TJ Lucas. A lot of people have been asking me about the body art in the logo. All the tattoos that you see in the logo were designed and created by TJ Lucas of Conception Gallery Tattoos in St. Joseph, Michigan. And of course, I want to thank all of you for tuning in and sticking with us through this transition. There are several changes that I've made to our online presence. For starters, our website domain has changed to truthandjusticepod.com. That's truthandjusticepod.com. Our new email address where you can send in your thoughts, theories, and ideas is theories at truthandjusticepod.com. Our Facebook page is now entitled Truth and Justice with Bob Ruff, and our new Twitter handle is at truthjusticepod. I hope all of you continue to stay in touch, and together we can stay united and see this thing through to the end. But for now, I'm signing off. I'm Bob Ruff, and this has been Truth and Justice. Simplicity and ease is what you get when you host your podcast with Audio Boom. You can post up to five episodes per month, you get unlimited storage, and 500 minutes of recording time for each episode. Plus, advanced analytics, embeddable players, distribution of your podcast via Apple Podcasts, Deezer, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Sovin, Spotify, and Stitcher. Pending approval by each platform. Right now, you can sign up for Audioboom's $9.99 monthly subscription plan and get your first month free by using promo code BOOM. That's B-O-O-M for one month free of hosting and distribution. Sign up for our $9.99 monthly subscription plan today.